or to me, or to Goldberg, who's But I happened to see that uh, you know, Professor Deslong was in town speaking about this new book, and some of you may know his work uh, about welfare states, but so this is something of a departure perhaps from that earlier work, but I'm sure uh, meets the same high standards. Uh, he's University Professor Emeritus of Social Science at the University of Amsterdam, where he's been teaching since 1973. Uh, he's Dean of the Amsterdam School of Social Science Research from its founding in 1987 until 1997, and has been its chairman. He's written for the periodical... De Gids. De Gids. <laughs> My Dutch is very poor, I'm afraid. Uh, but a very important uh, publication in the Netherlands, and for the Handelsblatt in our city, and the Handelsblatt, which may be familiar to, to you. He's won many awards. It goes on and on and on. So I think you get a sense of uh, the importance and, and distinction of his work, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about this new book a great deal. And we're very fortunate to have with us uh, as a discussant this evening, Dr. Simon Adams, who is Executive Director of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect, which is a part of the Ralph Bunch Institute. And if that term is not familiar to you, perhaps I'll leave it. Simon to say a few words about the notion of the responsibility to protect, but suffice it to say, the idea is that this is a kind of new understanding of sovereignty, and um, states are expected to have a kind of affirmative uh, concern for the well-being of their populations, not uh, the kind of older notion of sovereignty, which sort of says they could do, in effect, what they might have wanted to do with their population. So, uh, in other words, he's directly involved with research and advocacy on as atrocity crimes and writes and speaks about these issues and advocates on in this regard in UN circles and government circles around the world. So uh, I think he's the perfect person to uh, comment on this uh, on this presentation. So let me turn it over to Abraham Swan, who will speak for half an hour or so about the book and its contents and its arguments, and then Simon Adams will respond for ten minutes or so, and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you, well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very glad to be here to see some familiar faces. Some uh, the acquaintance go back to, goes back 40 years or longer. The old friends, you might say. Uh, but welcome, all of you new friends. Uh, I want to start out by. Uh, saying a few personal words addressed to a member, an emeritus member of your faculty at the City University of New York, Edmund Leitus, who is here, uh, because throughout the years, the seven years that I worked on this uh, book, he supported me throughout, as I mentioned in the preface, the place to mention such a thing. But now that we are here, uh, live, I would like to, to sort of dedicate the symbolic Enjoy. first copy of the book. Thanks. And thank you again. I'm very glad much. I didn't have to write this myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say a few words about Avra and the book. It is a remarkable book. And um, uh, the scholarship went into it that's impeccable, but the subject matter is exceptionally painful. One of the challenges of writing such a book is to be able to write, and write year, do research and write year after year on a matter which is an exceptional, if you have any sense of it, exceptionally hard to face day after day or week after week. So the challenge for Avram, which he met most successfully, is to both maintain the clarity and analytic and moral perspectives on the matter which required a great deal of moral and intellectual rigor, and at the same time really confronting <coughs> the texture and reality of the kind of misery that he had to think about for these seven years. I was glad over the seven years in which I worked with him that I was able to be of uh, some support. This was mostly transatlantic, 
New York and Amsterdam, although Avram is all over the world, so sometimes I'd be getting a note from Suriname, or it could be from India. I just didn't always know where he was, but I was pleased. And I should say that Avram and I more or less the same age. I was born in 1939, fortunately in Chicago. You were born in Amsterdam, more or less from the same European heritage. And we have a father, a grandfather, intellectual heirs, and the people he admires, and the people my father, grandfather, and you. So it's a history that goes back. But we live on a canal in Amsterdam, and, Ma, and I in Hyde Park in Chicago, the son of a professor, more or less uh, have followed a similar intellectual trajectory. So it's been a great friendship for many lasting years. Delighted to receive this as one expression of uh, a, a friendship by treasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. I um, want to, to talk about the subject of the book, The Killing Compartments, which is mass violence. You might say genocide. But genocide also happens to be an international legal term, which is rather precise, but uh, awkward definition for practical, sociological, or historical purposes. So I generally speak about mass violence. And what I mean by that roughly is very asymmetric violence, that is, armed and organized people, mostly men, attack and kill, destroy unarmed and unorganized people. So it's very asymmetric. It's also on a mass scale. Uh, the more the masser, it's, uh, I cannot say where it begins, the more the worse. Uh, it's almost always connected with great upheaval. In the, in the eve of war, or during, in the shadow of war, or in its aftermath, or uh, civil war, or coup d'etat. So usually there is already great societal upheaval. And finally, almost always it is committed uh, at the instigation or directly by the state and its apparatus. Sometimes the state condones it, hides its parts in the killings, but most of the time it is quite directly involved. Surprisingly, on the matter of, of mass atrocities, mass violence, there is a very strong consensus in the social sciences and in history, a consensus which is extremely rare in our fields. Moreover, the consensus can be easily summed up. It goes like this. Ordinary people, under extraordinary circumstances, commit extraordinary evil. I think I have at least 30 titles in which these words occur in this constellation. And to start with, that's true much truer than most of us would want to realize. But in the, at the same time, I have the impression that this very strong conviction, which is shared by so many experts in the field and non-experts, uh, has blocked further questions about what kind of people, under what circumstances, get themselves into these genocidal situations, and uh, whether some of those people, in some respects, might be, to a degree, different from most other people. So it's a very gradual question. And I want to go into this matter. First of all, or what happens in the, the books which are written under this uh, motto, is that usually either in the preface or in the conclusion, suddenly the author addresses the reader. And he says, 
you or I, under the same circumstances, might have done the same thing. That's a scary sentence, especially since as a reader you're accustomed to not be immediately addressed. Uh, you doesn't exist in academic prose, and I is very rare. I only occurs in the preface when the author says that he was sorely missed by his family during the writing of the book. He keeps that illusion, never, one never knows. And then I disappears in academic prose, and you shouldn't exist. But here it is, you and I. Me? I just recently came upon a book about, uh, by a grandniece of uh, Himmler, uh, the Himmler brothers, and the uh, author, who of course takes her distance, at the very least from her grand uncle, has as a general uh, motto on the first page of her book, if you had been in the same shoes, you would have done the same thing. Well, I beg to differ <laughs> from Anne Himmler. I wonder, would you ever see that in a book on Churchill? If you had been in the same shoes, you would have done the same thing. There is something funny about this. Now, first of all, of course, it is what logicians call a counterfactual. You and I are not in the same conditions, and then logically there is no way saying what may happen. More importantly, it's a counterintuitive, because frankly, if you sort of realize what we're talking about, the same thing, the same thing is killing totally helpless people, naked people, uh, absolutely in help, uh, helpless, confused, in a panic, not just for one hour or even a day or a week, but sometimes years at a stretch, with machetes, with guns, with machine guns, it is literally unimaginable what mass violence really means. And it takes quite an effort of the imagination to think that you would come and enter in such a situation and there you would go like an automaton and kill, 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 because that's what we're talking about. So there are very, very many problems with these ideas. But certainly the insight that under certain specific conditions people may do things they would have never dreamt about is a very valid and important insight, and we owe it, among others, at, uh, to Stanley Milgram in his experiments. Now, in these experiments, very varying percentages of the subjects continue to shock a plant, an actor, who was given a memory exercise, and if he failed at them, then he was going to be punished with a shock machine. Uh, depending on the parameters of the experiment, between a third and two-third or even 80% continue to 450 volts, which they believed was lethal. Very strange experiments. And many, many more people continue to the very end than anyone would have thought. Because Milgram asked, before, asked a number of people, among others, a, a conference of psychiatrists about their estimates. But so the conclusion seems to justify it from the experiment that up to two thirds or 80% of the people under a tyranny would become collaborators, henchmen, killers uh, for the regime. Nobody ever says, well, maybe one third up to hell would join the resistance on the basis of the Milgram experience, which would be an equally valid conclusion. But the strangest thing is that this is the most replicated experiment in the history of psychology. Nevertheless, almost, almost nobody took the trouble to figure out what was the difference between people who continued to the very end and people who resisted. And I should say, in honor of Stanley Milgram, that the film he made himself of the experiment begins with a long sequence about a man who said no. He is an homely, sort of banal, ordinary man with 
the brill cream hair of the time and one of these large horn glasses. And at some point, he hears the, the subject, the plant, the actor scream. And he says to Stanley Milgram, or to the experimenter, you should do something about it. that man is uh, in, in pain. And the experimenter, according to the scenario, says, you must continue. So he continues. After a little while, the, man, the, the actor falls silent. So there's every reason to say that at the very least he has fainted from the electrical shocks. And the guy says, I really think you ought to go and see what's happening. And the experimenter says, according to the scenario, we cannot uh, interrupt the proceedings. And so on and so on. And then finally, the guy turns around to the experimenter and he says, I don't go for this, I want to stop. And then the experimenter speaks the final words in the scenario. He says, you must go on, you have no choice. And the subject says, how do you mean I have no choice? I have many choices and I quit. It's almost as if he had walked out of a novel by Jean-Paul Sartre, but he didn't look the part. Somehow, the presence of such people doesn't enter the experiment. Not in the 50 replications ever was there serious interest in what was the difference. And on the other hand, there were people who just continued. And then Milgram would debrief them and say, what, how about it? You went on and on and on. You may have thought the guy was it. And the, guy, the subject said, what do you mean? You told me to continue, so I continued. Weren't you worried about this person? No. I mean, he was stubborn. He didn't know his, his, he didn't memorize well. He was asking for it. In other words, here we had the ideal stone of Rosetta in the problem of genocidal perpetrators, an innocent genocidaire. He had the complete deep, had a mental makeup of a mass killer, but he had nothing, done nothing. So he could have talked freely, he could have showed all his motivations without incurring any sort of danger. So there's a strange unwillingness to ask more questions, which is typical of the entire field. Somehow, this important insight that people may do things that they would never have dreamt of under certain conditions has blocked further inquiry. Uh, even more so, it's considered the, 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 the final, uh, final error of this, uh, to, to ascribe to persons certain characteristics on the basis of their behavior. It's called the dispositional error. You shouldn't do that. There have been very important pieces of research which support to a degree the, the, the idea that indeed a genocidal, genocidal situation may bring many people to commit the utmost horrors. Maybe the, the most important is uh, Christopher Browning's book, which appropriately is called Ordinary Man. And indeed, uh, in that book, Ordinary Man, a group of Germans uh, go on to perpetrate, in, as the police battalion 101, the most unthinkable and horrible crimes behind the Eastern Front in Ukraine and Russia. And the point uh, Brown makes is these people have been rather randomly recruited from somewhat elderly Germans who had as yet not been recruited in the other uniformed services of the Reich and who went on to do what they did. Ordinary Man, the book is called. Uh, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen wrote a book Hitler's Willing Executioners, which had the subtitle Ordinary Germans. There is a subtle difference, because ordinary Germans in 1941, when this occurs, were not exactly ordinary men. Uh, if you and I would be in behind the Eastern Front, would we have killed like they did? Well, let's see. If you and I had been in the First World War, which was an unprecedented honor, uh, horror, 
And if then we would have returned to a German in the grips of hyperinflation, and then continue throughout the Weimar Republic in constant upheaval and sabotage and uh, terrorist murders against the uh, pristine democracy, if then we would have lost our jobs in the 30s in uh, the Great Crisis. And then from 1933 on, eight years of the vilest, the meanest, uh, racist propaganda the world has ever seen without the possibility of hearing any counter-argument, any opposition. If we had gone through all that, you and I would not be you and I, but someone else. So what does this imply? That people are formed in social processes that they are transformed through the upheavals of history, that they have been shaped by their cultural and religious experiences of childhood and adolescence and education, and that, for example, ordinary Germans in the 40s were not quite ordinary men, but a rather special brand of people for the great majority and this to a degree, well, we should not generalize. There have been people who were able to withstand throughout all those years. Uh, Browning, and that is uh, admirable, granted this point, even though Goldhagen had a fierce polemic with him, which Browning, I think, uh, won, yet that he was the professionally better historian. But he granted at some point that, yes, Goldhagen was right in giving a larger weight to the, 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 the preconditions, the, the uh, transformations that went into shaping uh, German sensibilities and insensibilities, uh, the, the German mindset of these days. So. If we want to, to, to look further into the matter, what makes them kill, what makes them obey, because these are crimes of obedience, of course, I think it's very important that we take a long-term macro-sociological view of the societies in which this occurs. <clears throat> and then probably we should be quite sensitive to the latent, the dormant divisions in a society. Uh, let's say, between Catholics and Protestants, or ethnic divisions. I mean, uh, New York City is a beautiful example of a city full of all sorts of divisions and, 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 and cleavages, which every New Yorker knows how to handle, how to manage, uh, how to accommodate. You all know that much better than I do. There is a whole etiquette. And joking relationships are essential. But even with joking relationships to handle ethnic uh, differences, one must be very circumspect. And even the dumbest New Yorker is pretty damn circumspect in handling them. That's what you learn. But almost all those divisions were at some point in other societies sufficient for horrible civil wars and, and, and ethnic cleansing. So you're happily living on a volcano, but partly that is because people know that is a society which uh, handles, knows how to handle these, these matters. Now, it may occur that a movement, a political party, if an especially inventive and creative politician begins to exploit such differences of religion, of class. Uh, a beautiful example is uh, Milosevic, who was a Communist Party member. And when Yugoslavia fell apart, he, well, there was general confusion about what sort of organizational basis he had to, to find. And Milosevic, at some point, heard himself explain before an audience, I'm dramatizing it a little bit, uh, 
never again will a Serb be beaten by uh, Kosovo. And the audience erupted in enormous uh, acclaim, yes, yes, and he had hit upon something. He was a creative, productive, inventive politician who was able to awaken these dormant sentiments which had been forgotten for 50 years, that they had once erupted and been violent and destructive, of course, in the horrible years of the civil war which between Croats and Serbs during the Nazi and Italian occupation. So there were memories, memories which I should say do not exist in New York City. Not like that. Uh, there were antecedents, and it's very important that uh, antecedents of violence may produce new violence when the movement, the regime, is uh, capable of exploiting them. So this is the regime level. And then what you can see is that if the regime gets uh, hold of the, 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 the state apparatus, uh, comes to power, it may begin to compartmentalize society even further. It may decide that the target people are very different from the regime's people. They should really go to different schools. They should go to different hospitals. They should, they should be on the streets at different times. They should live in other parts of the city. A continuous compartmentalization at every level of society. But this is policy. It's active work. It's an effort. It's political work. And then what happens is that people at a micro-sociological level begin to feel a bit embarrassed. You don't want to be seen with that sort of people, with the target people. I have nothing against them, but I certainly wouldn't want my daughter to marry them, not even my son. I would rather not live next to them because the, it's not because, I have nothing against them, but the, the real estate values go down when these people come in our neighborhood. All sorts of justifications. Uh, and embarrassment may be the central feeling with which this operates. And then there is a, what I call, psychosociological level, because I expressly want to confuse psychology and sociology. I want to act as if I didn't know the difference. Therefore, I call it psychosociology, <laughs> uh, where people, as it is called very well, internalize the feelings, the ideas, the regime has spread about the others. Uh, I call that disidentification, uh, identification with one's own group, disidentification from the target group. Uh, you could call it othering, but when you other, you need also selfing. Is that, that doesn't exist, huh? selfing. Selfies exist, but othering and selfing, the more you other the other guys, the more you feel together, uh, uh, we exist by virtue of, of I self, them. So it, is a, it can become a very strong personally experienced emotion. Like, uh, for example, not so long ago, the idea existed that a healthy man, a healthy male, had a vital abhorrence of homosexuals. When he was confronted with them, he would feel a Gut disgust of homosexuals. That was a sign of a healthy man. I think it was even uh, uh, common medical opinion in, in the United States. It certainly was in Germany. Well, it has disappeared into thin air. The vital abhorrence. You could have feel a vital abhorrence of Jews because that testified to the fact that you yourself are a real Aryan. A real Aryan would feel yeah, spontaneous. So politics becomes very personal, very intimate. So this is the compartmentalizing process at all levels, which may have precedes mass violence. But it's sort of uh, 
finds its, its, its very essence in certain compartments which have been shielded off society, which are secluded, and where the actual killing takes place. Uh, and there, in a, a, a reserve, in an enclave of barbarism, that's the word, uh, anything goes. Any cruelty, any ecstatic destructiveness is acceptable. It is actually encouraged by the regime in cold calculation. So while the perpetrators go wild, go berserk, the regime exploits this very barbarity. You could call it regression uh, in service of the state. And some of you may recognize a psychoanalytic formula, regression in service of the ego. Uh, so people are, in, the perpetrators are encouraged, allowed and encouraged to regress. And for themselves, it's important to think that they went wild. They were not themselves. They went out of their minds. All right. But this still does not answer the question, what sort of people get themselves more easily, are more prone to get themselves into such situations? And what sort of people will be more eager killers, or rather indifferent murderers, or rather reluctant executioners who try to stay away from it as much as they can? You must forgive me that I cannot produce hard evidence. I cannot do field work next to the executioners. That's impossible. It is too wild a situation. You cannot get into a cold room without being boiled. I cannot take 100,000 uh, healthy Americans, wait 20 years, and see whom of them become war criminals, uh, and then try to do a differential uh, test, like, for example, in evidence-based medicine. What we have is some judicial evidence which is highly misleading for a number of reasons. One, genocidal perpetrators generally don't get punished. Only in very exceptional cases, when the regime is thoroughly defeated, do some of them ever appear before their judges. We have Serbia, Croatia, we have Cambodia, we have Rwanda, and Nazi Germany. But the only serious prosecution was in Nazi Germany and Rwanda. Uh, Cambodia to this day is a failure. <coughs> Even in the rare historical episodes that end in total defeats where perpetrators are being prosecuted, uh, a t only a tiny minority. And the perpetrators generally are only a few percent of the population. The people who do not commit atrocities, who stay away, you don't see. They're not, in, they're not observed, they are not in the literature, and therefore the only ones we know, see are the perpetrators, not the people who stay out of it. And the only perpetrators we see are those of defeated regimes who come before their judges. And before their judges, they are not in good shape. They must try to wiggle out of the situation, and therefore they present a certain image. So I must be very careful in what I'm going to say. Let's, what I'm going to do call a conjecture, like in mathematics. What you do is you take the best available knowledge in the field, and you make a conjecture about a certain scientific problem, what might be the... And I'll give you my conjecture, based on what I have read about perpetrators. And I would say, first of all, many of them tend to be, certainly to have a conscience. There's no doubt they do. They are loyal to their comrades. They are obedient to their superiors. 
And quite often they're devoted family members. It's a strange fact, but we have to face it. But everybody beyond that small circle can just drop dead, and they're perfectly willing to help a little, help that person. So it's a very restricted circle of conscience, of moral conscience. And secondly, they have a low sense of agency. They don't, they usually present themselves and think about themselves as people who just got in trouble through no decision, no volition, volition of their own. As a Dutch uh, uh, literary professor once said, they choose definitively for not choosing. But that is also something a defendant would say before his judge, well, I got myself into trouble, Your Honor, I'm very sorry. Somebody said, I was looking for a job. Somebody said, I, I know a job for you. It's uh, something, uh, being a guard. Where is that? In Sobibor. Oh, never heard about that. Well, I got to Sobibor. It was sort of a funny place, but since I was there anyway, I often say to my sociology students, your account of how you came to study sociology is remarkable remarkably similar. Uh, so let's be careful. Still, it's a striking feature. And the third is the most important. These are generally people with no empathy and no pity. Almost by definition, otherwise they couldn't do the job. But we're not sure whether they lost that sense of sympathy because of the brutalization of their uh, circumstances, or whether maybe they never developed it. What I have sketched is what Peter Fonagy, a uh, British uh, psychologist, calls failed mentalization or dismentalization. Uh, and as I say, it's a conjecture. I cannot present hard evidence, I can only quote sources. Uh, and then I'll stop here. There is a great riddle. The victims of mass violence to this very day live with what we call their traumas, their wounds. Veterans of symmetric wars come back and suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome, or what used to be called shell shock. But the genocide dares, after the facts, seldom or never show any problems, which is strange and amazing. We know of no case, and Charney and Baron have tried hard to find, uh, of no instance of a German perpetrator having sought pastoral or psychotherapeutic help. None. Their children, yes, not them. Uh, here is a riddle. How can these people who are strongly conformist have lived in a society that made a 180 degree uh, turn in which they lost all support and sympathy? People who have gone through very, very shocking experiences. And how can they live apparently without the slightest trace of psychological conflict? I leave the Question open and the floor to thank you. Just move this over here. <clears throat> thank you for that, um, Professor De Swan, and um, it's an honor to be here with you and to get to say a few comments um, about the book and about the, the presentation that we, we just had. So maybe following on from Professor Torpy's comments to just explain um, what I do and why I'm, I'm here. So I run an organization called the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. And we were set up by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan and Gareth Evans, the former Australian Foreign Minister, and Desmond Tutu and some other folks in 2008 um, to work exclusively on this international norm of the responsibility to protect. So on a day-to-day -day level, we work mainly with the UN Security Council on uh, situations where atrocities are either imminent or are actually happening. Uh, 
um, and work with UN member states more generally and the Human Rights Council in Geneva around promoting and protecting human rights, particularly in situations where uh, things are heading in a very disturbing and, and worrying direction and there's a, a risk of mass atrocity crimes. And so, it, you know, it might not surprise you when I say that um, I read an enormous amount of literature uh, in this area on the situations uh, that we were involved in either now or historical cases because we're always trying to look backwards in order to understand why things happen the way that they do in the present. And I think this is a rare book in the sense that it's got fresh ideas in it and it actually forces you to try and look at these questions from a different perspective. And I, I, and I mean that as the highest possible compliment I think it, that, that you can, can pay a book. It's incredibly well researched, um, incredibly well argued in your second or third language, I presume. Um, and But it, it really throws out some, some challenging ideas. And maybe just to... to to follow on from that a little bit. So in the work that I do, I, I've had opportunity to do a lot of work in the field as well as here in New York, um, working with, with the UN and, and elsewhere. And I, I, when I was reading this book, I, my mind kind of went back, first of all, to Rwanda, where I got to work after the genocide, and a country which I've been to many times uh, since the genocide. And I remembered one of my first visits to the country, um, <clears throat> and driving through the Rwandan countryside, and everywhere you go uh, at that stage, you would see former perpetrators who were in pink pajamas, which were the, the prison uniforms that the new regime put them in. So they were immediately identifiable. And they were often loaned out to the families of people that they had killed to work the land of the absent fathers, husbands, brothers, sons, and so forth, because there was a massive labor deficit afterwards. And you would often see them in the morning and in the afternoon going to and from the barracks where they were kept in a, in a kind of uh, similar to like a prison outwork situation. They weren't kept in prisons as such. They were kept in work camps and then they would go out to the local farms and then come back. As I said, normally in the areas where they'd actually committed their crimes. And the thing that was kind of uh, awe-inspiring and terrifying in equal measure is often you would see them actually jogging and singing down the sides of the roads, carrying over their shoulders the machetes and the hoes that they had actually the same implements, the same farm implements that in many cases they had carried out the genocide with. But now they were often working in those farms to help survivors of the genocide. And while I was there on numerous visits, I went to Rwanda. I got to visit uh, Gachacha, which was the the attempt of the Rwandan government to kind of, uh, they couldn't deal with all the perpetrators for the formal justice system, so they had a kind of informal justice system built in the communities. And I wanted to mention that because I remember a, a one particular experience where I was going to a gachacha and I was seated with a friend of mine uh, who is an academic, uh, unlike me these days, um, and he is actually, the child of two Holocaust survivors. He spent his whole life working on Holocaust studies. Survivor of Auschwitz and a, uh, another child survivor who was hidden by Russian peasants during the Second World War. And we were seated right, seated right here next to, it was in a school in a village, and they brought out the, I think it was six guys who were gonna go to Gachacha that day. In order to go to Gachacha, you have to confess, as I'm, I'm sure you know. Um, and so that means the onus of responsibility is on the perpetrator to explain why they did what they did, which kind of shifts the whole dynamic uh, of the conversation. But quite surprisingly, even though they're talking about genocide, it can actually get quite boring after many hours of kind of questioning. So the perpetrators were lined up, waiting to go out one at a time to con be confronted by the village where they conducted these crimes. And so, of course, they inevitably tried to have a conversation uh, with us who were sitting here. And we're put in that uncomfortable situation of trying to figure out what's the etiquette around talking to a genocide perpetrator? You know, is it polite? Is it appropriate to just shun them and look the other way? Do you tell them how much their actions sicken you? Or do you answer their question about where you come from and what you're doing here and what you think of Rwanda, where have you visited, do you think it's beautiful, and so forth. 
And I, I really couldn't figure out exactly how to respond, and my friend Mark actually had a completely different response, the, the son of the two Holocaust survivors. He said, oh, he was sort of whispering to me over, over my shoulder, and he was saying, you know, they're, they're not really that bad of guys, considering everything uh, that they've done. And then I, the other statement he said that, that I really remember, he said, it's kind of hard to hate them, don't you think? And you know, at the time, I think we both realized that, that, that we were missing uh, the point of, of that encounter. Because, and this is something that really rang true for me when I read this, this book, and I, I didn't have the intellectual wherewithal at the time to kind of think through it in the way in which you have with this magnificent book, which was that you know, they were neither banal nor psychotic, nor is a, an entirely situationalist explanation rationalize what, what they did. And for some of them, there was a mixture of motives. For some of them, it was partly materialistic. So you know, when I would talk to some of the perpetrators, they would talk about how one of the things that was great about the genocide was they ate meat every night, um, which was unusual for a Hutu in, in Rwanda in the 1990s. Not all of them would admit to that, of course, but, but some of them would, would, would talk about that. And so, you know, in all of the places that I've, I've got to visit where atrocities have taken place, from East Timor to Cambodia, um, you know, the question remains, and I think that's the question that's at the core of this book, which is, you know, how and why do some people participate? And how and why do some people not? And I, I think you're very correct in identifying the second part of the question as being the one which is most fascinating to us and is least well answered up until uh, the killing department uh, was written. I mean, another thing that, that really struck me in Rwanda as well was what hard work genocide is. And you know, you would hear these accounts from perpetrators talking about going out uh, every day and, and killing and chopping. And I remember going uh, to Batare to a school where, uh, sorry, to a church in Batare, which is up near Lake Kivu in Rwanda. And you could literally see the machete marks in the concrete floor. That's how hard they were hitting people. You could still see blood spraying on the, on the roof. I was talking about this to a, a graduate student today, so it's fresh in, fresh in my mind. And I remember talking to a survivor there who said that, who had hidden under bodies, and said they were exhausted. So they would kill for a couple of hours and they would stop and go sit under the banana trees and they would guard the perimeter and they would rest and then they'd come back and do some more killing and then the sun would go down and then people would try to sneak away during the night and then they'd come the next day and do more. It was incredibly hard work. So, you know, I think we've learned some things since 1945 about perpetrators. And just as we learn from the, the past to kind of prevent and protect against mass atrocity crime, perpetrators also learn in order to get away with it. And I think you, you do an excellent job in drawing out those elements which make a successful mass atrocity crime. The importance of incitement and, and of, again, it's a very imperfect word in English, but I can't think of a better one, of othering. Mm -hmm. um, the, command, the importance of command and control over the, the, the perpetrators. And I think something which, which you, um, you didn't mention in your talk, but which is very, I think, features in your book, is the climate of impunity. They have to feel that they're going to get away with it, that there's not going to be consequences for this. There might not be great rewards, but there certainly won't be negative consequences. You know, when I, I had actually read this book right after I'd re returned from Cambodia. I was in Cambodia a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, the, you talk about this in your book, but it, it, it really rang true for me about my experience in Cambodia is that when you look at the main killing fields, whether it be uh, Tol Slang, S21, or Chongyek, which was the classic killing field, they relied on secrecy. Secrecy was so important. Control, secret spaces, secret work, control of the spaces, control of, of how people interact with them. And that contrasts very much with, say, something like Rwanda, where it was open but it required a much higher level of incitement, a much higher and longer period of, of othering, of building up hatred against the Tutsi in order to manufacture uh, this thing. Because I think there's a common sense view in many Western countries that uh, 
that Rwanda just, and it, it's, I have to say, it's kind of grounded in some fairly stereotypical and somewhat racist notions about Africa, that somehow this thing just exploded like, uh, and that people suddenly started killing each other. It's not the case. Actually, the Rwandan genocide was constructed over a long period of time uh, through the marginalization of the Tutsi, through hatred, through discriminations, uh, and, the, and in, including earlier episodes of mass violence, which didn't end in genocide, but certainly ended in number of lives lost. So the point about Rwanda, though, which um, I just kept feeling when I was at, in my many visits there, and I think you, again, draw this out so well in the book and all that you say about the experiments and so forth, is despite the pressing weight of that history, despite 40 years of incitement, some people still hit people, even at, and, and in their case, at real and tremendous risk to themselves, literally, potentially, punishment. Uh, hit by with them. a D. Hit, yeah, yeah they, yeah, they yeah. hit Tutsi. They, yeah. they took Tutsi children in. They hid people in their attics or under their floors when the risks were absolutely um, enormous. And, you know, after reading this extraordinary book and its insights, I think we've gained a new kind of sociological and psychological perspective on how to understand perpetrators, how they create spaces physically, and how they create them psychologically in which atrocities can be perpetrated. And, and it poses that really fundamental challenge, which for me is the most interesting one, for which is how do we understand those who refuse? How do we understand, uh, how do we strengthen that spirit? Is it a question of space? Is it a question of situation? How do, we, how do we look at that and understand it better? Because surely that's part of the answer to the bigger question of how we prevent and protect people from a recurrence of these crimes. And I'll just say one final thing before I shut up, because I'm sure people have many questions they, they want to ask the professor. But immediately after reading your, your book, when I finished the conclusion, I, there was this quote from Primo Levi that came to me, that I kept thinking he was touching on something like this, and I couldn't get it right in my mind. So I did that obsessive compulsive, you know, academic thing where you're racing to the bookshelf and pulling down the books and looking in the index and not being able to, to find it. But I did eventually find it. It's actually the last sentence of what I think is actually quite possibly his best book for many reasons, but it's a book called Moments of Reprieve. It's not as famous as The Drowned and the Saved or The, or the One of It. The, the one that's about Auschwitz have different names depending on, on what country you happen to be in. Um, but Moments of Reprieve is an amazing book, and it's the last sentence of the book, and he talks about Romkowski, who was the Jewish collaborator in one of the ghettos, who went from kind of being a member of the Judenrat to actually handing over uh, elderly Jews to the Nazis in order to, to stave off supposedly the mass transportations and uh, was somewhat brutal himself and of course ended his life uh, very tragically at Auschwitz with his entire family. But uh, Levy talks about Romkowski and this is the last sentence. He says, like Romkowski, we too are so dazzled by power and prestige as to forget our essential fragility. Willingly or not, we come to terms with power, forgetting that we are all in the ghetto, that the ghetto is walled in, that outside the ghetto reign the lords of death, and that close by the train is waiting. And I think this book really enables us to understand better what Levy was trying to grasp all those years ago. So I thank you very much. Thank you for good words, and uh, I'm also intrigued because you have seen very many things with your own eyes which I have ne not seen, because I never went to any of those places. Uh, I've thought about going there, uh, but I never did, for various reasons. Uh, and still often I think that maybe Rwanda would be a very instructive experience for me because there was an attempt to write things. Uh, Rwanda is one of those cases in which 
Much of the killing had a spontaneous air about it, and as you say, these were, it was, uh, it was directed by the Intrahangwe and by the Hutu power government. Uh, what is intri intriguing is that in a village, let's say with a thousand people, maybe there were maybe ten convinced killers, and they made an effort to, to bring other people so as to dilute the responsibility to make everybody a little bit complicit. Uh, but you never see the people who were in there. And when you uh, hear the accounts of Ian Gross or of uh, in Oppenheimer's film about Indonesia, you forget most people were in there. So, for example, a young man would say, I want to go there too and see what happened. And his mother would say, You stay here, touch, touch, touch. And so people. So there is a very strong element of self-selection coupled to, as you say, incitement and actually threats of very strong pressure to participate because if you didn't, sometimes you risk to be killed yourself. Uh, so it's a very complicated mechanism. One book which I find especially enlightening about Rwanda uh, was by Fuji. Her first name escapes me, but she's a, movie. she's a young American anthropologist who went to one of the villages and tried to reconstruct uh, what happened there. A number of uh, PhD students have gone to the villages and tried to, to talk to the villages and find out what happened. And they have come up with very important information. But the image Fuji paints is even in those villages where the whole thing seems spontaneous. Uh, there was a, a ritualized way of building up the climate for killing. For example, they used to paint their faces white and dot, uh, adopt banana uh, leaf clothing, and they would dance and play drums and excite themselves. And then they would go to a big Tutsi, a rich Tutsi, and they would sort of taunt him and scream at him and say, well, uh, you are nothing but a... Huh? And then the man would appear, a man of prestige in the village, and they'd be a little bit scared. And sometimes he would simply give them palm wine, and then they were satisfied. But other times they would come back, and they would go in the field and kill his cow. And exactly what you say, they very, it was almost like cigarettes in the Second World War. Okay. People would do anything for them. And then they would, and they would eat his cow. And then they would say, you big shots, we just killed your cow. Ha, what are you going to do now? Now we're going to get your wife. And so they would, it was a whole ritualized way which went back with many elements of, say, local cultural tradition to build up a killing compartment. In other words, even though it was not secluded by fences and by watchtowers, it took a, a, a ritualized way to create a killing compartment and to identify those that were to be killed and those that were to be spared uh, by a ritual. And when you read the accounts of ethnic cleansing as they went on, again you see a, a certain uh, ritualized way of creating a, a time and a scene and a place for the killing, which almost always also is accompanied by outrageous, in our eyes, completely unnecessary, excessive cruelty, especially against women, I should say. Uh, and what exactly goes on there, why it would be so outrageous, and someone like Horowitz, for example, calls it carnivalesque. There's a strange joy, and, 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 and but it's, where joy is not exactly, but out, outrage would be very good. Uh, but it tends to, to convey that people are outside of themselves, that they're beyond themselves, that they have been transformed into what the word is wild, or animal, or beast, or. Uh, uh, so that no normal consideration still applies. This is completely outrageous.
uh, well, this is what came to my mind about Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda, of course, and, 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 and former Yugoslavia were the two formative experiences in the late 20th century, which rid us from our illusions that this would be a thing of the past. And probably for you too, it must have been. Absolutely. Yeah. So there we're sitting with suddenly worlds in which this can happen time and again. I don't know if the, do you want to throw it open, John, too? Mm -hmm. 